Hi everyone and welcome back to another Excel Academy YouTube video. Today we are going to be taking a look at Rural and Urban Settlement and this is part one of the Rural and Urban Settlement notes which forms part of the IB Geography Syllabus. So let's first ask ourselves, right, what is settlement geography? As people have settled on Earth, they have tried to make life for as comfortable and efficient as possible. In attempts to do this, people have imposed their culture on the Earth. The most visible of these marks of man are buildings, roads, railways, and other avenues of communication and boundary marks such as fences and walls. Settlement geography is a study of these constructions in an attempt to discover their distribution and function. One of the most basic divisions of settlements is into rural and urban settlements. Here's a basic definition. And there are three criteria to be considered. Size, form, and function. All of the above three are useful in making the distinction, but none of them are entirely satisfactory. Firstly, size. This would be a classification according to population numbers. Size is a useful guide, and as a rough rule, it could be said that the smaller settlements are usually rural, and the larger ones are urban. But it must be borne in mind that there can be many exceptions to this rule. Secondly, pattern or shape. This method of classification considers the shape or pattern of settlements. Settlements may be either dispersed or nucleated. It is useful to think of nucleated settlements as being urban and dispersed settlements as being rural. And finally, function. By function, we mean an attempt to find out the main purpose or activity in a settlement. One of the main problems is that settlements tend to change in character and function as they grow. A small farming village may eventually become a thriving commercial centre and eventually a big industrial centre. Thus, its function changes and classification becomes difficult. Another problem is that many settlements show characteristics of many functions, which make it difficult to slot it into any particular category. A very general classification is to group settlements in terms of primary, secondary and tertiary activities. If a settlement is predominantly occupied with a primary activity, i.e. farming, mining, fishing or forestry, it is classified as being rural. Such settlements are said to be single functional, i.e. the people in them are all concerned with a single activity, for example, a farming village where almost all its inhabitants are farmers. If a settlement is mainly concerned with secondary and or tertiary activities, i.e. commerce, industry and services, then it is classed as urban. Such settlements are said to be multifunctional, i.e. a wide variety of different functions are found in it. The classification thus becomes rather subjective. In summary, then, we might say that rural settlements tend to be small, concerned with a single functional primary activity, and may be either dispersed or nucleated in form. And finally, urban settlements tend to be large, concerned with multifunctional activities of a secondary and or tertiary nature and are usually nucleated. Now let's take a look at nucleated and dispersed rural settlement patterns. The study of patterns of rural settlement concerns the manner in which individual buildings are spaced in relation to each other. The two extremes are those patterns which are dispersed and those which are nucleated. Some reasons for nucleation and dispersion include agricultural systems, protection, population density, culture, 
water and we'll be taking a look at a few more. So let's first take a look at agricultural systems. Nucleated patterns often arise in systems of communal agriculture, whereas dispersed patterns can result from individual cultivation and the piecemeal extension of farmland. Animals usually need more attention than crops and therefore require farmers to be closer at hand. Nucleated patterns are more likely to be found on flat, fertile plains and dispersed settlements, or rather dispersed patterns, on broken and hilly terrain. Second reason for nucleation and dispersion is protection. Nucleation is often common in areas of social and political instability. The third reason for nucleation and dispersion is population density. Nucleation is more likely in areas of high population density, sometimes for no other reason than a lack of living space. In China, some rural villages are so compact that half the inhabitants are housed under a single roof. It follows that dispersion is more likely in areas where the population density is low. The fourth reason for nucleation and dispersion is culture. Nucleation is more likely in communities with strong family, clannish or tribal ties. The fifth reason for nucleation and dispersion is water. Nucleation is more likely in wet point settlements. A wet point settlement is one in which the settlement develops around a source of water in an otherwise arid region. For example, oasis settlements in deserts. In contrast, a dry point settlement is one located so as to avoid water where the water may be hazardous. An example would be a settlement built on higher ground to avoid marshy or flood situations. Dispersion is more likely in areas where the shortage of water is not a problem. For example, in regions of high rainfall where many perennial streams are to be found. The site and situation of rural settlements. Early people looked for natural advantages. On the one hand, they selected suitable sites. The word site refers to the actual plots where a settlement could be built. They looked for suitable situations. Situation means areas or districts which offer the greatest potential for settlement growth. Factors governing the selection of sites and situations include water supply, dry land, defense, shelter from weather, agricultural land, trade, and finally service opportunities. Now let's take a look at the pattern of settlements by firstly taking a look at the isolated farmstead. The isolated farmstead with its accompanying outbuildings and other facilities, is the smallest and most elementary of all settlement types. This is where a single family lives and works in isolation from other farmers. Secondly, we have our nucleated settlements. When the dwellings of farmers are clustered together to form villages of farmers, the settlements thus formed are called nucleated settlements. And here are some examples uh, below. The ways in which any village has grown have been determined by a combination of four factors. Firstly, topographical, which is the physical nature of the site. Secondly, economic. The form of the village is determined by the system of farming or the type of trade. Thirdly, historical. The form of the village is determined by the necessity for defence or the opportunities for serving other communities. And finally, cultural. The customs of different racial or tribal groups has an influence in deciding the form of the village. So let's take a look at the, the loose-knit or fragmented village. In these settlements, dwellings are scattered irregularly over a fairly large area, too close to be considered isolated, yet far enough apart 
to suggest no evident interrelationship and no obvious nucleus. Clustered villages occur where dwellings are close together and there is a fairly well-defined division between settlement and countryside. They most often focus upon root centres and their shapes are normally determined by the pattern of communication, be T-shaped, cruciform or star-shaped. Linear villages are elongated settlements that may have developed either for reasons of trade, in which case they would be aligned along a road, river or canal, or for reasons of physical limitations, as a settlement lying along narrow valley floors or along narrow ridges. Now let's take a look at our last topic for today's video, which is depopulation of rural areas. So, some reasons for rural depopulation can be categorized into push and pull factors. Push factors concern situations in rural areas which make life in rural areas unattractive. Pull factors concern situations in urban areas which make such areas attractive to rural people. Some push factors include fewer job opportunities because mechanization has decreased the need for human labor, droughts and economical farm units, consolidation of farms, the amalgamation of smaller farms into economically viable larger units reduce job opportunities in rural areas. Low wages, in comparison with the wages offered in industry farm wages, are unattractive. Crop diseases and pests, and high production costs. Costs of fertilizer, seeds, and machinery are increasing, making it difficult for farmers to make ends meet. The pull factors also attract people from rural areas, and these include job opportunities, Cities, since the Industrial Revolution, offer a more abundant and wider variety of job opportunities. Wages, too, are higher in the cities. And our final push factor is services and facilities. Cities offer much by way of educational, cultural and health services in comparison with the rural areas. That concludes part one of this video on rural and urban settlements in South Africa. Stay tuned for part two. Remember to subscribe to the channel for more content and like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching.